I wanted to thank Katie Christensen for inviting me to be on this panel. It's an honor to be here and to thank Jordan so much for um, sharing this uh, collection of work with us. I'm super excited and my students and I are going to spend a lot of time in here this semester. The subtitle of my talk is Contemporary Women Artists Resistance to an Embodiment of the Domestic Realm. So please keep that domestic realm in mind as I'm speaking. What I'm showing you here is Lorraine O'Grady's avatar. Mademoiselle Bourgeoise Noir, who's going to the New Museum. It is a guerrilla performance at the New Museum of Contemporary Art during the opening of a show called Personae from September of 1981. There'll be many instances where I talk about this particular performance piece at many different openings. Mademoiselle Bourgeoise wears a gown and cape made of 180 pairs of white gloves. She dons a tiara, elegant long white gloves, and a sash akin to those of beauty queens and suffrage women, announcing her as Mademoiselle Bourgeoise Noir. Most ambiguous is her expression, lipstick lined mouth agape, bulging throat muscles suggesting she is in mid yell, eyes intense and glowing. Yuri McMillan in a new study on black women's performance art suggests that her refined and opulent attire appears at odds with the fierce ecstatic look on her face, the disjuncture indicating that this outfit may indeed be a costume. For indeed, the artist was in the midst of invading an art opening, shouting angry poems against the racial politics of the art world. It would be fitting if she were amongst us in the galleries today. Well, what about that domestic realm? Starting with Betty Friedan's controversial 1963 book, The Feminine Mystique, middle-class white women started to question and then rebel against being trapped in the domestic environment. Mick Jagger's lament, Mother's Little Helpers, lends a sense of angst, desperation, and utter boredom to such women's predicaments. Artists have embraced this boredom, what the French call ennui, since the 19th century, when, as a result of the Industrial Revolution, men's worlds and women's worlds became separate spheres. The men's power in industry allowing for a new leisured status among their middle-class wives. This is perhaps nowhere more compelling than in such paintings as Claude Monet's Meditation, Madame Monet on a Couch from 1871. Madame Monet is encased in a well-appointed interior. She has put down her book and is thumping her thumb on the book's cover, looking languidly toward the window, on edge. Such tension is reiterated in the Maison Femme series of the French-born New York artist Louise Bourgeois, who links a woman's body with the house itself. She has become the house. She is trapped in it. Such a stance takes an obsessive turn in the hand-beaded works of Liza Liu, whose installation Kitchen was on display in this museum in 2005. In discussing the work, she proclaimed that she got tired of watching her mother spend countless hours keeping the kitchen spotless. So she decided to make her one that would always be sparkly clean. Well, what you might ask does this work and its message have to do with Kara Walker? If we consider that a woman's body is directly identified with the domestic interior and that it in itself is thus canceled out, then consider Olga Gambari's commentary on Walker's work. More than the face, Africa was the body. Arguing that these words render the substance of Kara Walker's work, she continues, her silhouettes of paper and projected light on bodies, the body of that caged humanity, offended in the form of stereotypes that become prejudices and then sediment as archetypes. Bodies rendered invisible, canceled because denied as identity. Mademoiselle Bourgeoise is a black woman covered in white gloves. We can attest to O'Grady's purposeful use of white gloves as a reference to minstrel dancers' white gloves, placing Mademoiselle Bourgeoise in a long line of stereotypes of black entertainers. But further, Mademoiselle Bourgeoise Noir is French for Miss Black Middle Class. As her alter ego, O'Grady describes her fantastic, hyperbolic life story. She won her first title in 1955, and after decades of maintaining a ladylike silence on the occasion of the Silver Jubilee of her coronation in Cayenne, she deigned to celebrate by invading the New York art world. 
The debut of O'Grady's irate debutante came on the opening night benefit for a show called Outlaw Aesthetics at the first gallery in New York dedicated to regularly exhibiting the work of artists of color, particularly black artists. O'Grady used her doppelganger as a conduit to express her disdain toward what she perceived as the overly safe work of fellow black artists she had seen at an opening of a previous exhibit, Afro-American Abstraction. At that show, O'Grady was initially joyful, wandering the packed galleries and corridors which were filled with her fellow black artists, all of whom looked like her, all of whom were interested in art. In contrast, she left despondent once she saw the art on the walls. It was too cautious. She felt it had been art with white gloves on. At the subsequent performance, she whipped herself with a white cat of nine tails spiked with white chrysanthemums and shouted at the bemused gallery denizens turned spectators, that's enough, no more boot licking, no more ass kicking, no more buttering up, no more posturing of super ass simulates, she separates those two pieces of the word. Black art must take more risks. O'Grady's confrontational character became a potent physical critique one often similarly hurled at Kara Walker about black artist assimilationist aspirations to enter the mainstream and hence the overwhelmingly white art market. Consider an artist who brings together the erasure of the woman in the domestic environment at the same time that she addresses a black woman's erasure and subordination to her white mistress, Betty Starr's Aunt Jemima. The white woman's leisure, so miserably apparent in Monet's portrait, creates the need for the black mammy, whose domestic labor is signaled by her broom, but whose resistance is implicated by the shotgun, showing enough is enough, the white glove has been thrown down. But compare it with Walker's insurrection from 1997, which similarly parodies the white world's parody of the black world in its positioning of a black Sambo, not as subservient, but rather in charge. His cooking pan is not on a stove, but rather on his head as a helmet, and his broom has become whittled into a spear. Thomas McEvely pairs these images to show the real affinity between the two generations of black women artists. Yet Saar, along with her contemporary, Howardina Pindell, attacked Walker. It seemed unlikely to them that Walker could have good intentions in using such derogatory stereotypes of African Americans. They saw Walker as betraying her race. I think otherwise. Like any living artist, Walker is cagey about positioning herself and offering simple answers. But I think that she, like Mademoiselle Bourgeoise Noir, and all of the women who rejected the domestic realm for a larger world, was taking off the white gloves to hit us head on. White gloves and caution gone with the wind. In this regard, I would argue that Walker's work is aligned with the work of black women performance artists in taking a stand and pushing the envelope, and not only setting the house on fire, but also in resisting being a representational embodiment of that house as a subservient. She asks us to look with fresh eyes at a long tradition of misrepresentation, and in that look, emancipating it. Um, Katie asked me to talk about what I'm going to be doing with my students. My History of Women Artist students, some of are in the audience today. Um, I threw them in at the deep end, as I said earlier. Um, in terms of doing some readings on Kerouaca to prepare them for this panel this evening. Um, but we'll go back and do the whole history of art and sort of figure out how we get to Kerouaca in terms of where women started as artists. So that'll be an exciting part of what we do in the History of Women Artists class. They'll be doing individual papers. One of the pieces I'm most excited about is because we have the Shepherd Symposium coming later in the semester, uh, the symposium being about social justice, I want them to come back into the exhibit and think about the dialogues that we've created about Kara Walker here and that we're gonna to continue to have in class and see if those match up or if they're expanded um, by those dialogues that are going to happen at the Shepherd Symposium and to do a kind of comparative analysis of that. Um, I also teach a gender and humanities class, and that is a class where we do art and literature uh, and gender, and this exhibit is going to be particularly rich for us um, because we do a whole section on autobiography and gender, so thank you, Carrie, for talking about her, um, her life and that, that shift that happens when she moves 
um, to Georgia. Uh, because I'm going to use this exhibit as the introduction to the section we're talking about autobiography and gender. We'll be looking at slave narratives um, and positioning how her life changes and how it is often gendered. Um, so that's one of the things we'll be doing. Also, I have a whole unit with my students where we work on stereotypes. So obviously this, this work is going to be very rich for helping us. And I like the way Carrie positioned it in terms of talking about the flatness and how that reverberates on so many levels. Um, so that will be useful for us too. Of course, in all my classes, we talk about race, class, and sexuality. So for both my History of Women Arts class and the Gender and Humanities class, we'll be looking at that. We look a lot at very hard images, images of violence against women, and ask why that's necessary. Is it necessary? How can we change that imagery? And certainly, that's one of the things that Kara Walker is asking us to think about. Thank you. Thank you.